Thank you very much. Uh, we now come to my dear friend Nicholson Price, who is an uh, assistant professor of law at the University of Michigan. You teach and write in the areas of intellectual property, health law, and regulation. And we, you previously were um, assistant professor of law at the University of New Hampshire and a fellow at the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard Law School. That's also where we met. Um, so I'm very happy to have you here. And you, we're bow tie again. I, I don't. You know, I broke the tradition. I'm sorry. I'm disappointed in you. Um, so I have to say, though, I, I can't talk from here. I can't be in this room and not talk from there. This is so much better. Fits you really well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about a topic that might seem decidedly less sexy, but I think is still incredibly cool, uh, which is the issue of innovation in manufacturing. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, so here's the basic issue. Um, we think about developing drugs as the hard bit and finding out whether or not drugs work as the hard bit, and we think of drug manufacturing as the easy bit. But it turns out it's also pretty hard, and the way we manufacture drugs is not great. It, we think it's pretty cheap, and it's pretty easy, and it's pretty high quality, but it turns out it's not cheap, and it's not easy, and it's not high quality. I should say, by the way, this uh, project for me has been a, a long time in the making. It arose out of some early work uh, that actually uh, ben Royen helped me uh, think about uh, early in the days when I was a Petrie Flom fellow. Uh, Glenn Cohen helped me develop it. Uh, and the biologics part that I'm going to be talking about with, uh, I did a lot of thinking with Artie Rye, who's at Duke University. All right, so this is to look at the problem of what's going on with drug manufacturing. Uh, how isn't it good, and how do we fix that? So just a roadmap. Uh, I'm going to talk first about small, mo small molecule drugs and why manufacturing isn't so good or how it's not so good. Uh, I'll talk about some of the implications of that and then some of the mechanisms. Uh, I'll turn to talking about biologics, where the story gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, and then I'll finish up with some potential solutions uh, and this project and where I think it might be going. Uh, so this is just a, a list of the amount of drug company uh, expenditures they spend on R&D versus manufacturing for small molecule drug companies and generic drug uh, companies. If you talk to some people, by the way, they'll tell you these figures are total lies. Uh, I don't have better ones and I don't have access to the internal numbers of drug companies. I believe that they are approximately true-ish. We'll go with that. Um, so the main message here is, turns out manufacturing is actually pretty expensive for a lot of drug companies, at least assuming they're not lying to the SEC. They spend more on manufacturing they do, than they do on anything except marketing. Uh, generics, unsurprisingly, spend tons of money on manufacturing because they sell drugs uh, at not a huge amount higher than the cost of manufacturing. Another weird thing is that manufacturing it costs more than you think, and it's also, in, now, by the way, you can look and say, ah, oh, aspirin is super cheap. It's true for the small molecule you know, capsules or tablets that we make billions and billions of every year. They get pretty good at those, but there are a lot more types of drugs that require a lot higher manufacturing costs, things like sterile injectables and more complex formulations and things like that. So don't think just a little white pill. Think of the larger panoply of drugs. All right, so drug manufacturing is expensive. It's also not good. So most manufacturers discard around a tenth of a percent of their products because they don't meet quality standards. For drug manufacturing, that's more like 11%. Tons and tons of drugs are discarded because they make the drug, and then in batch testing at the end, they find something's wrong with that batch. And we don't know exactly what it is, but we're just going to throw it out and try again. That's bizarre. Right? That's really weird. Some of these are drugs that have been around for 50 or 60 years. You'd think we'd get really good at making them, but instead we make them basically the same way that we did 50 or 60 years ago, and we don't do it very well. It's weird. Um, other drug companies, by the way, uh, or sorry, other manufacturers have gotten really good at manufacturing. Right? You think about how Toyota has gotten at making cars and how other people have learned from the Toyota model of this kind of continuous improvement. That sort of thing just doesn't really happen in the drug industry, at least nowhere near to the same extent. So what are the costs of this besides it being inefficient? You know, if it's small costs, who cares? Turns out the costs aren't so small. So this is, uh, these are the human costs of drug recalls. In 2009, there's contaminated propofol. In 2012, lots of examples of these. Excedrin that was contaminated with opiates. So 
really good at painkilling. Um, 2014, we had gabapentin capsules where some of them shipped empty, which is not so great if you're happy to actually get the, hoping to get the benefit of the drug. 2018 already, we've had particles in vials, glass particles in vials, cracked rims on vials, mislabeled laxatives. Uh, non-sterile drugs and microbial contamination, all of these uh, drug recalls in the last couple of months. Also on the human side, we have drug shortages. This is an ongoing problem. It's not quite as bad as it used to be before the FDA stepped in with some serious actions, but we've got lots of new drug shortages every year. This is weird, right? It's weird that we have drug shortages. Those sorts of things we think shouldn't really exist in a well-functioning market. Well, what causes them? Turns out of the ones where we know the cause, about 64% of them are caused by some sort of manufacturing problem. Manufacturing processes just aren't that robust. Turns out, by the way, this graph is a little bit misleading because that whole graph, that whole circle, is uh, the 47% of drug shortages where we have some idea as to what the cause is. About 53% of them we don't know the cause at all. In terms of the economics, this is a McKinsey study. It's probably eight years old by now. But the estimate was uh, that if we could drop manufacturing prices by 20%, uh, we'd get lots of benefits. If we just used that to lower drug prices, we'd see something around a $50 billion a year uh, increase in consumer surplus just based on the prices. If instead we plowed that back into R&D, uh, we'd see more like a $550 billion, $574 billion a year uh, in health gains. This, of course, is assuming that manufacturer R&D works as well as it does, and lots of assumptions here, but the takeaway message is manufacturing is pretty lousy and it turns out that's pretty costly. So why? Why is manufacturing not so great? We know that drug companies can innovate, right? We see them innovating all the time, some of the time. We know that manufacturing can be innovative. We see things like food companies getting really good at manufacturing product, uh, packaged foods. We see car companies and electronics companies getting extremely good at manufacturing. But somehow we don't really see drug companies getting good at manufacturing. So why? Well, one answer is the reasons are kind of complex and I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I've written a bunch of things on this so you should all read them and that would be great. Um, but I'll say slightly more than that. There we go. Um, so, in part, it's about lousy incentives, so patents here uh, are hard to enforce, which is to say, if you get a patent on a manufacturing method, how do you know if somebody's manu violating your manufacturing method patent? Well, you've got to kind of wander into their factory and find out, and drug companies don't really like that. So it's tough to enforce these patents. Instead, most people do their manufacturing in secret. Secrecy is much easier to enforce, but the challenge of that is that as an industry, you don't really learn, right? An individual drug company may say, okay, well, here's my method and I'm gonna keep it secret, but nobody else knows about that. Nobody else can learn from that. Nobody else can figure out a better way because everybody's in their own little pool of secrecy. There are also some regulatory barriers that matter here. Before a new technology, or before a new drug is approved, it turns out FDA doesn't really love new, new manufacturing technologies. There's actually, there's this wonderful testimony from a guy named Norman Winskill who was, uh, in regulatory affairs at Pfizer and was basically saying, look, if we've got a manufacturing process that FDA is familiar with, it'll just sail on through and it's not a problem. But if we start to say, here's our cool new way to do this, well then all of a sudden the folks at the regulatory agency start to get interested and they start to ask lots of questions and that could take a long time and maybe they'll say, maybe you should do some more, some more demonstration that this technique really works. And that's the kind of delay you just don't want. Once you've got it approved, well, then you really don't want to change things because if you change things, you have to go back to FDA and say, hey, I changed stuff, does this work? And they say, well, let's talk. That's not a good outcome if you're a drug company. What you'd really like is for them to just go away and not really talk to you very much. There's not much incentive to try to fix this either on the front end or on the back end. And so what I think we get in terms of putting all this together is a kind of secret stasis where a company will figure out what to do, keep it secret, and keep doing it as long as they can. Uh, I'm actually gonna tell my favorite, my favorite story about this, which is the case of uh, a mixture of um, estrogens that is distilled from the urine of pregnant mares, which is called, which well, is to say uh, female horses, it's called Premarin, uh, and it was used, to, or it's, it's used to treat uh, problems arising from menopause. It was developed in the 1940s, it was patented then, 
Despite the fact that a patent has to tell you how to make and use the product, they don't do it very specifically. And so even after the patent expired, uh, they kept their manufacturing process secret. They made it only at this one manufacturing plant in Manitoba. Nobody else could figure out how to do it. And in fact, 70 years later, still nobody else could figure out how to do it. And so there was no generic version of this drug for decades after the patent expired because nobody could figure out how to make the same thing. And it turns out FDA had said, well, you have to make the same thing for it to count as a generic. But it's too complicated. We can't figure it out. We can't actually know what this exact drug is because it's this complex mixture of estrogens. So you've got to make it the same way, but nobody can figure out how to make it the same way. And so we have this weird problem of competition. Which leads me to the second part of this, which is when we get into biologics, where it gets a lot more complicated. So biologics, um, just first to define them, right? So this is aspirin. It's little. This is a biologic. This is a monoclonal antibody. It's a lot bigger. Um, the analogy that I've used before that I still love is if you think of a uh, small molecule drug as like a bicycle, a small biologic is like a, a Toyota Prius, and a large biologic is more like an F-16 fighter jet, or whatever you have over here. Um, <laughs> these things are way, way bigger. And they're manufactured in a really complicated process, right? So I'm not going to take you all through this, but it's complicated and it's idiosyncratic. When you try to make something, you figure out a cell line and then that you think will be good, and then you take that cell line, whether it happens to be cells from the ovaries of Chinese hamsters or human cells or Pichia pastoris, yeast or E. coli bacteria, all of those, by the way, are used. Um, you pick one that you think might work, and then you basically shotgun DNA at it, and then you have a bunch of colonies, and you pick one, and you don't really know what happened. You don't really know exactly what's going on in that particular cell line at the end and then you just keep using it. And then you try to figure out how to purify the protein and you don't know exactly how it's working. You've got some decent guesses, but over the course of this development, you figure out what seems to work for you and then you get a thing at the end. And then you take that thing and you run it through clinical trials and you have a decent idea of what the thing is, but you don't know exactly what it is because it turns out our science isn't quite good enough to say, well, this is exactly what this biologic is. We can just say, yeah, it's approximately that, but I can make it again and again every time as long as I don't change a thing. And so then you take that, that thing, that biologic, and you run it through clinical trials, and you say, hey, look, it works. And FDA then approves it. And now you've got this thing. And the question is, well, what if somebody else wants to make the thing? What if we want to have generics versions, generic versions of that biologic? Well, it's hard to do, just like that mixture of complicated, or that complicated mixture of estrogens uh, in Premarin. Right? We don't know what it is, so how do you get the same thing? Well, you have to make it the same way. And it turns out that the regulators often say, well, if you can tell us exactly what it is, then go ahead. But otherwise, we would like you to either show that you can make it the same way or, you know, get as close as you can. The less you know about this thing, the less you can make exactly the same thing, the more work we'd like you to put in on the back end, the more clinical trials we'd like you to run, the more we'd like you to show that, yeah, even if we don't know what your thing is or the first thing is, they seem to work approximately the same in humans. And it turns out that's really expensive, which is why these strict regulatory definitions lead to us, and this leads to the fact that we have biosimilars instead of generics, right? We don't have generics for biologics. We have generics for small monkey drugs. We have biosimilars for biologics because we don't know that they're the same. We know that they're the same-ish. They're similar. They seem like they work, and this causes all sorts of problems in terms of trying to develop a really robust competitive market. What that ends up resulting in, of course, is the possibility for a lot more exclusivity than we bargained for. Right? We have the patent system on the one hand, as, as, uh, as Ben and uh, Kathy have talked about, we've got the regulatory exclusivity system, but then we have this additional thing, which is manufacturing secrecy. Nobody can figure out exactly how to duplicate it. And so that adds in some extra time on the end. And we don't know how much it is, and we don't know how powerful that is, but it's something else. It's an additional piece of the bargain. The other big challenge, of course, is it turns out this is a pretty good deal for the drug companies, right? If the answer is I've got exclusivity and it's going to last for some undefined period, maybe it'll last for 70 years like Premarin. It's not going to last that long anymore, but it'll last for a while. And that relies on nobody knowing what's going on. 
and nobody knowing how to manufacture this with really excellent tight control and understanding all the steps, and nobody being able to characterize these biologics to the extent we really understand what's going on, we really understand how to make them, well, I don't have much of an incentive to break or to develop that knowledge, right? Why would I figure out how to characterize biologics really well? Why would I figure out exactly what makes all the manufacturing steps tick? It's great if nobody knows that. And so what I think we'd expect to see, I think we see, is that there is development among biosimilar companies trying to figure this stuff out. But many of the companies that have the strongest databases, the strongest set of knowledge and expertise for how to really figure out how all this ticks, there's not a particularly strong incentive for them to want to figure out how it all ticks. So how do we think about solving these sorts of problems? Yeah. There we go. Um, so we can think about incentives. We can think about the standard panoply patents. You know, these are tough to work. They're tough to enforce. Trade secrecy. Trade secrecy is not so great. It helps contribute to the problem. You can think about maybe regulatory exclusivity for manufacturers, something like this. All of these feel like they're not really getting at the heart of the problem. We could think instead about government research on this. Maybe the government should put a bunch of money into figuring out how do you make biologics to try to make this problem easier. There are actually some interesting efforts along these lines. The National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, outside DC is working on some of these issues. Uh, interestingly enough, with lots of industry buy-in when it looks like the kind of things that aren't going to threaten exclusivity, and much less industry buy-in when it's looking at the kind of things that are really not going to cause a big problem for this sort of trade secrecy enforced extra exclusivity. What I think is possibly the, um, the way to think about this is we think about this as kind of disclosure, as a disclosure problem and a problem of moving from one equilibrium to another. So I talked about secret stasis before. There's a way in which the current problem of drug manufacturing, both biologics and small molecule drugs, is a pretty easy place to stay. It's pretty easy to stay relatively secret and relatively stagnant in terms of innovation. Just don't develop new stuff, just keep flowing along. So we can imagine a graph here where we say on the one axis we have innovation and the other axis we have disclosure. And now we're at a place where we don't innovate a whole lot, we don't disclose a whole lot, and it's easy to stay there. But we can also think about moving to a place where we have, oops, uh, both more innovation and more disclosure, where rather than this being a point of let's all stay in our own independent places, there's more disclosure throughout the industry, more knowledge sharing, and more saying this isn't a way of keeping competitors out of the market, this is just a thing that we'd all like to do better at, whether it's making small molecule drugs or understanding how biologics work so that, say, if you move your plant to one, from one part of Ireland to another part of Ireland, you don't have a 20% chance that it's just not going to work at all. Now the question, of course, is how do you do this? How do you move this? I'm not crazy to think that this is possible, by the way. I've talked to some industry folks uh, and listened to some presentations where they say, we really need to start sharing all this information. And then we could learn things and it would be great. And it's possible they were all blowing smoke. I don't know. But it's not at least crazy to think maybe we should just compete on things that aren't, can you actually make this product? We might think that as a society, we would like drug companies to compete on other things, and maybe we just say, you know what, we're going to mandate by law that you disclose this stuff. And you have to disclose how you make drugs in your chemistry and manufacturing controls. You have to disclose that when you get approval, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Um, where does it go from there? I, I, I don't know yet. But the cool part is that that's what this project is about, to trying to figure out uh, what's going to happen and how can we move this into a better place. So very briefly, uh, the project is about kind of surveying this incentive landscape in more depth, trying to get stakeholder views and figure out what might be doable things and what might not be, evaluate some of the practical impacts, and then finally figure out policy proposals where we can take a problem that we don't really think about a lot but has really negative impacts uh, and make it into something that's a source of innovation and transparency rather than uh, a set of problems hidden below the surface. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Nicholson, for introducing study five on drug manufacturing biologics to us. Um, you also linked a little bit to what Jakob says. The sharing is, again, a key term uh, which, which we will have to examine and how, how that can work in this area. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, another name for Nicholson is uh, Mr. Black Box uh, Medicine. So you're also involved in the precision medicine study with Harvard Law School. So you're not only dealing with that project. So we're very happy to have you with us.